Our first reading comes uh, from the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning at the 14th verse. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptised. And that day, about 3,000 persons were added. For the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. A second reading comes from 1 Peter, beginning at chapter 1. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you invoke as Father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without deflect, without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have seen you have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of God endures forever. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke, chapter 24, beginning at the 13th verse. Glory to you. Lord Jesus Christ. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognising him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place? 
in Jerusalem, who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. And now our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe what all the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near to the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was walking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, friends, uh, this is a piece of scripture uh, that's found only in Luke. Uh, those of us who are used to coming to church and who uh, have been a long time in the Christian tradition uh, would probably recognise the story, The Road to Emmaus. Uh, it's become such a popular story that uh, many things within our churches and traditions uh, give name to the Emmaus. We have youth camps called Emmaus. Um, and uh, it, it is in our hearts and minds uh, whenever we think about going on a faith journey. But also, it happens on the same day uh, as the resurrection and the women finding the empty tomb. So it reminds us, uh, not just as people who may not be so familiar with the Christian tradition, but us as Christians, that Easter doesn't finish on Easter Day, of course. We have a whole season of 50 days of Easter, of celebration, uh, of which we're still in uh, today. So let's have a quick look uh, at this little journey into Emmaus, or the road to Emmaus, and the scripture we had this morning. Well, one interesting thing to note is that we actually don't know who the two were who were walking on that road. They're unknown disciples. And we know that they're not part of the inner circle of Jesus' friends. They're not part of the eleven. Because they actually go and tell the eleven what had happened to them. So it's interesting that as they're walking along this road, it's two uh, 
unknown uh, disciples who have this experience with Jesus. So as they walk along, as we just heard, they're talking about the things that had just happened uh, in Jerusalem. And you could imagine, you could imagine their disappointment. Quite possibly mingled with a bit of fear. And they were quite downcast. And then Jesus comes and walks with them and talks with them. But they have no idea that it's him. And he interprets to them all of the scriptures about him. They have this uh, great discussion. And they make it all the way to the place where they were staying. And they beg Jesus to stay with them. Look, it's, it's late. Just come and eat with us. And it's at this point that Jesus breaks the bread, offers the wine. And when they partake in this, we're told their eyes are opened. They recognize who Jesus was and that it was them in front of it's him in front of them. But as soon as that happens, Jesus vanishes. It's only then that they remember, weren't our hearts burning inside of us as he approached us on that road? Weren't our hearts burning inside of us as we were talking about the scriptures and understanding what they meant? So I don't think it's it's as important to get down to literally what happened uh, on the road to Emmaus. You know, could they have walked seven miles in that amount of time? And there have been countless amounts of ink spilled about that. But there are some really interesting themes that we should be able to pull out of this. Themes that actually go further, further than just a historical event. Isn't it true? That as a Christian community, even further, as a community as a whole, broader than the Christian community, that when we are discussing things of faith, things of theology, when we are having these disagreements and discussions, Christ is intimately with us. The Spirit is with us within these discussions. But quite often, We don't recognize that. Quite often we can get caught up in our own ego about wanting to be right. Uh, Often we can get angry at each other and think, well, because we disagree, because we may see someone else as uh, too judgmental or or not judgmental enough at times, uh, that we feel actually an absence of the Spirit within us. But friends, it's within that struggle that the Spirit moves and lives. And we are told in the epistles, you know, to love and to love deeply. That's true holiness. Not being right. Not convincing other people. But loving through our discussions. So when they get and break bread and drink wine together, that's when we truly encounter Christ. That's the most intimate time we have as Christian people, coming together for the Eucharist. And we mourn that we cannot do that at the moment. But we do it spiritually in our hearts every Sunday. At that point, we come so close to Christ. And we recognize Christ. But do you notice when they ate on this Emmaus journey, Jesus vanishes straight away as soon as they recognize him. Well, it could be said that when we come together in the Eucharist and we partake of the bread and the wine, we absorb that into us. Christ is no longer physically before us. In a sense, has vanished. However, we take on the responsibility of being Christ here on earth when we partake in that Eucharist. We go out and proclaim to the world the good news that Christ gave to us. And that is our duty. That is our discipline. So it's good to proclaim the things that have happened over Easter. It's excellent. But sometimes I fear, and my fear is that we spend so much energy on trying to convince people of a historical event. Much of the time that's wasted energy. No matter how good we are as orators, 
We're simply not going to convince some people. Maybe we can't convince me. But maybe that's not actually our duty. Maybe we need to redirect some of that energy to living Jesus, to proclaiming Christ, which isn't convincing of a historical event, but it's living in such ways that we live in holy love that people can't help but be moved by how we are as a community, by what it is within us that makes us be honest with ourselves and each other, that allows us to have these really difficult theological discussions or just discussions in general, and yet still live with grace, to be thankful, to hurt, but do so together, and to come together each Sunday and be given so gratefully in the Eucharist. So friends, let's continue the journey of Emmaus today with each other. Let's never be afraid of discussing and disagreeing. But let's do it in holy ways, filled with love. Let's be thankful for the grace uh, of the Eucharist when we get to come back together. And let's not so much convince, but live Jesus in our everyday lives with everyone we meet, with each word that we say and each breath that we take. In the name of God, the Creator, Redeemer and Sustainer. Amen.